We are live. Hello, and welcome to our first Medicine for Members webinar of the year. I'm Nikki Barnard, our Membership Manager here at CUH, and we have a very wide audience joining us tonight, either via Zoom, or thankfully now that it's working, the CUH Facebook page. We are delighted that so many of you could join us this evening. Before we begin with our much anticipated talk this evening on the Cambridge Children's Hospital, I would like to encourage those of you watching that are not already CUH Foundation Trust members to please go to our website and have a look at our Foundation Trust page. There you will find more information on membership and of course how to sign up. Just remember that if you are a staff member of CUH, you are already in fact an automatic member. Now to get on with what we all came here for this evening, we are privileged to have an incredible panel of speakers and hosts join the discussion tonight. Nikki Macy, Cambridge City Councillor and Partnership Governor at CUH, has graciously agreed to be our host this evening. And so, without further ado, Nikki, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I really am so excited about this project. Um, I can't just express just how excited I am. It really is so amazing to have this project coming here to the Cambridge City and, and indeed onto the Adam Brooks campus. We are so privileged to be able to have such a massive move in children's health coming up on board. You know, nothing has like this has been done before. We are integrating mental and physical health to benefit the children, to benefit families and parents. And we, we really are going to be doing some world breaking stuff here in Cambridge. And I think it's really important that everybody gets on board with this. And so as Nikki has already said, do become a um, part of the membership um, in order to find out more. It's, it really has been an amazing journey for me as a partnership governor, which I'm privileged to be, but also as a city councillor with a role in leading in, on health for the city. Um, in order to actually get this children's hospital off the ground. It really is a personal challenge for me. I myself, I'm a mother and I've been a mother to a sick child who has had many difficulties and indeed we lost him sadly in 2013. So knowing how important a project such as the Cambridge Children's Hospital will, is to parents and to the children that they'll be caring for, um, I find it just really tremendously exciting. Um, without further ado, I would just like to introduce to one of our first panel members, Dr. Rob. Um, I can't pronounce his surname, so I'm going to let him say it. Hi, Scott. Thank you. The CUH Clinical Director for Cambridge Children's Hospital. Um, thanks very much, um, Nikki, for the introduction, and welcome everyone um, to hope what I hope will be an inspiring and uh, enlightening talk from from us. Um, this evening and it, it's an absolute pleasure to um, be able to share our vision and, and talk you through um, what we um, feel is a really unique uh, opportunity for children right across the region. Um, the way that we are, are going to talk through this um, is um, in true integrated fashion um, with me introducing the, the sort of physical health side of things and uh, Sally Benson from CPFT, our, our lead um, clinical psychologist, talked to you a bit about one of the key factors in our, our collaboration, which is the integration with mental health. And David is going to um, uh, provide you the, the insight and the inspiration from the University of Cambridge for the, um, uh, the unique partnership around genomics and, and the exciting research that we really want to focus on children. So, what we feel this project sets out to do, and I think uniquely um, aspires to, is integrating mental health with physical health and um, research into one building. So I, I wanted to start this evening by, by telling you about um, a four-year-old girl from Norfolk, who I think really epitomizes what we want this hospital to be able to achieve for children. She's already received care um, under um, Adam Brooks and, and the mental health team. But I think what I would like, I, I want to tell you her story because it e exemplifies how we want children right across the region to be able to access care in the future and benefit from our, what we are like, what we're wanting to call whole new way of approaching child health. So uh, Zofia was a, a four-year-old girl who, who was completely fit and well. 
Her parents noticed that she was um, uh, tripping up, stumbling, took her to a GP and quite quickly and, and, and sadly for the family, uh, a brain tumor was diagnosed on scan. She was transferred um, with her family to Addenbrooke's where she had um, an eight hour neurosurgical operation by the pediatric neurosurgeons. She then was on intensive care with the pediatric intensivists and received chemotherapy from our oncology team and daily radiotherapy from adults, uh, ad adult experts in, uh, at Addenbrooke's who provide uh, radiotherapy right across the age range. She subsequently made a, a really fantastic recovery, but not surprisingly, both her siblings and her parents, uh, it had been an incredibly stressful and, and traumatic um, experience for all of them. And so she was supported by play specialists, by Sally and members of her team in uh, normalizing the experience and preparing Zafaya to get back to, to, to her home, to integrate with her family, and to get back to um, uh, school and, and, and her local friends. And the, the care that we provided both in Addenbrooke's and, and from the Mental Health Trust also reached out to interact with um, the local community nursing team, with the local pediatrician and with her GP. She made a fantastic recovery and, and, and remains very well with a curative procedure. And I think what, what we did for Zafaya and what the teams came together to do um, for Zafaya was, was uh, I think, clearly game-changing for her and her family, but something that was done really against the odds in many ways. So we are the only region, surprisingly enough, in, in, in the UK without a dedicated specialist facility for children's health. So we have no children's hospital, and I think that's one of the reasons that the government took note um, of our long-standing plea to, to invest in, in a facility like this. Adam Brooks has become the hub for 16 other acute hospitals around the region. And CPFT, our mental health partner, provides regional inpatient mental health uh, services for one and a half million children in this region. And I'm sure as many of you will know, um, the population here is growing exponentially and not least the children um, who, are, who are requiring care. And as surprising as it seems, the, the current setup uh, at Addenbrooke's and, and um, within CPFT provides only about half of the care that we are currently able to, that, that the children in the region are currently able to uh, are currently require. So a, a significant number of children and families have to travel out of region for specialist care every year. Those of you who know Addenbrooke's, I've put this slide in, it's, it's quite dated as, as you will recognize. You will see that this is how children's services are still provided across the campus. So there is no coordinated, co-located, dedicated space. A journey for someone like Sophia across the trust will involve 16 or 17 different locations. And, and that's the first thing that we really wanted to fix with um, this new children's hospital, to bring together all of the services across the campus and co-locate them with mental health in uh, a single building. But it's also an opportunity to bring children um, from around the region into um, a central hub at a time that they need. And, and a key part of the, the, the promise that we are making as, as Cambridge Children's is to communicate much better than we have done before with the rest of the region. And of course, COVID has helped us in, in pushing that forward. And um, I just wanted to, to highlight a few of the ways that we want to do better for the region's children in the, the hospital that we, we uh, intend to build at, at its hub. So there are much better ways now to communicate, as we all know, um, between um, families between um, medical and, and clinical staff, but also between doctors sharing knowledge and expertise without having to travel to outreach clinics, without having to uh, get children with um, families to travel centrally and, and um, come to Addenbrooke's. So there have been dramatic changes just within COVID, but there are, there are some amazing opportunities about providing care to communities right across the, 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 the region without having to make people 
travel and um, turn up in, in person. So we're really looking forward to joining up um, care for children uh, right across the east of England. So Sally's going to say a bit more about this um, in a second, but I, I just wanted to outline what I think is the most unique aspect of our vision, and that is to bring together the care of children with physical health and mental health. So traditionally, the, the, these groups of kids have been managed separately. And we currently have the Ida Darwin site where inpatient mental health is provided um, in Fullbourne, and we have our physical health facility at, at Addenbrooke's. And what this hospital is seeking to do with government funding is to combine those wards, combine those facilities in one building, where we will be able to work alongside mental health professionals dealing with children as a whole, rather than as a separate physical and mental health um, uh, problem, if you like. And Zach on the left hand side um, is a perfect example of this. He came to the physical health um, uh, unit, the, the gastroenterology unit at Addenbrooke's um, on my service with persistent long standing vomiting. Um, it became clear to us quite quickly that this was not an organic problem, but we needed help from psychology and psychiatry. And very early on, we were able to uh, manage his um, vomiting in a timely way and get him back home. Jasmine from Yarwell um, was uh, admitted um, in the eating disorders unit and um, ran into difficulty with physical health problems. Um, but of course, at the moment, this requires um, patients to move between units. What we want to do is be able to provide care for both these children together around the patient in a, in a, in a more suitable um, and, and appropriate area. And, and this is just a taster of what we think our integrated joined up facility could provide. We want to be the first hospital that really designs a purpose built environment for children with mental and physical health. We want to therefore give equity of access to all populations, whatever their healthcare needs. We want to have age appropriate areas and particularly stressing the needs of, of teenagers who very often get overlooked in a children's hospital. We want to make spaces flexible and interchangeable so that there's no obvious division between a mental health service and a physical health service. And we wanna do that with children and families so that the shared spaces are much more normal and um, uh, representative of children and their ages rather than their conditions or diseases. Shared eating and play and recreational areas, but also um, shared uh, areas for transition to adult care um, and schooling. So an environment where the child feels at home, the family doesn't have to make complicated uh, and challenging decisions about um, which facility to use and which doctors to, 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 to see. So you'll know the, the setup of, of the Addenbrooke's campus, which is ever changing, and even this looks quite out of date. The Rosie Hospital um, is um, where we hope to link into the main building. The Children's Hospital itself is earmarked for the Greenfield um, corner of um, uh, Dame Mary Archer Way, and we hope to connect into the neonatal intensive care unit above ground and um, with a tunnel below ground so that we're still getting access to all of the fantastic expertise um, on the Addenbrooke's campus. There's a master plan which involves other buildings and, and hospitals over the next um, 10 or 20 years, but as you can see, we are um, uh, tied into that corner and very much hope that we are the uh, first substantial building that will go ahead over the next um, few years. Just this week, um, this, this talk coincides nicely to the announcement that we have just appointed a design and construction team of really world-class experts to help work with us, our staff, our children, um, to design what we think is going to be this unique facility. So Turner and Townsend will coordinate um, international architects, white architect from Scandinavia, Hawkins Brown, and um, a, a number of other experts, both in digital uh, healthcare provision, but also engineering. And we think that this group will come together over the next six months to begin to really make tangible um, this project um, for the region. My final, almost final slide is just to give you a little bit of the logistic update of the, the project. 
Um, many of you will know it's it's now two years ago since um, we were awarded uh, the hundred million pound um, grant from the government to start off our uh, children's hospital um, uh, ambitions uh, in real time. Um, during COVID and the early stages of COVID, we were really um, delighted to have our strategic outline case, so that the, the, the proposal accepted by the government. And even over the last six or nine months, we've been able to make progress during COVID. And of course, COVID itself has brought challenges um, for pediatrics, but also some real benefits. And, and, and I think uh, in many ways, we will be able to modify our services uh, in a good way as we develop this, this new building. We've got lots of work to do with staff, um, asking for help, support um, on design, on engagement, on fundraising, um, but as well as um, setting up a children's network right across the region to help um, come up with designs that um, will, will be age appropriate and, and make this very special. We've set ourselves an enormously large fundraising task where we want to match the government funding with national and international um, support, both from the University of Cambridge but also from ACT, uh, the Addenbrooke's charity and head to toe CPF's um, fundraising arm. And um, so the final slide from me, just to um, uh, remind you of where we're headed. Uh, it seems an impossibly, implausibly uh, short timeline, but we are still bullish about um, starting um, building in 2023 with a construction date at the end of 2025. So that's all I was going to say as an introductory um, uh, summary of where we're at in the Children's Hospital. I'm sure there'll be um, questions at the end, but I'm going to unshare my screen and pass back to Nikki um, before we go on to Sally to talk a bit more about um, integrating mental health. Thank you so much, Rob. It really was interesting, particularly listening to the story of Sophia and her journey. Uh, which obviously your, the hospital is already working across departments in, from children's to adult services in order to help our children. But to be able to do it in one place would be absolutely fantastic and it's really exciting. I just want to remind people that if you are watching on Facebook, and indeed, if you're watching via the webinar link, you can ask questions. So just pop it down in the chat and we can get those answered. But I just want to hand over now over to uh, uh, Sally, Dr. Sally Benson, who will talk to us more about the mental health side. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. So um, welcome everyone. And I'm following on from Rob talking about the whole new way. Um, I'm guessing you might be wondering what we mean when we refer to the whole child. So we, we don't think parents see their children in two halves and we want to move on from an artificial separation of the mind and the body and mental and physical health services. We want to be thinking about all of the child. We don't want to just focus on their illness or their presenting physical or psychological symptoms. So a lot of this work is already in progress across CUH and CPFT but we want to find more effective ways of working across traditional silos. Thinking whole child for us is all about organizing systems, services and professionals around the needs of the child and the family. When we talk about the whole child, what we mean is, is that we don't actually believe you can deliver the best possible care without connecting up three key elements. And these are, the biological, the psychological, and the social, sometimes referred to as a biopsychosocial approach. So from a biological perspective, this is the physical element. We need to understand what is um, physically wrong or not working in the child's body. Psychologically is the mind part, and we need to pay attention to how a child is making sense of what's happening to them and what they're being told. We know we need to really understand the impact of the physical symptoms on the child and their life. From a social perspective, this is all about what's happening around the child. There's no child without a family, school and a friendship system around them. And these systems we know profoundly affect how a child feels about themselves. And with tiny babies, we focus on the mother and baby relationship and the mother's relationship with their partner. 
So taking all these important factors into account, not just focusing on the child's illness, that's what we mean when we talk about providing care for the whole child. So I'm gonna move on now and talk a little bit about what this means in practice, not quite then yet. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it looks like. And we've been working um, on this at Adam Brooks for quite a few years now. And we're pleased to tell you that this biopsychosocial approach is quite embedded in our services. So we have multidisciplinary team working around children with chronic and life limiting conditions. And that's our business as usual. So for example, in the gastro team, we have medics and nurses, psychology, psychiatry, pharmacy, speech and language therapy, dietetics, and a research team. And there are many medical specialties that have a similar mix. Very soon, we have a family therapist starting to work across all teams across the division, which we're very excited about. So to summarize, the whole child approach is region wide and it's about collaborating with regional partners. We feel very strongly that we want to keep children out of hospitals unnecessarily. We think that the whole person, that we need to pay attention to the whole person and not the presenting problem in isolation. And we want to work really closely with our partners who support and local teams to support the child. Turning to staff, um, we also know that patient care is only as good as our workforce and staff training is at the heart of our children's hospital plans. The whole workforce force will have a basic understanding of mental and physical health and we know that's absolutely fundamental to our vision. So every staff member will be trained on site to work in a whole child approach. Integrating a culture of staff support is high, high on our agenda as well. We know that rates of secondary traumatic stress and staff burnout, burnout can be very high, but we also know the good news is we also know how to help protect staff from this. So the physical and ward environment is really key. And obviously the plans for the, the hospital with fine attention being paid to that, the culture of the team too. But we know too that self-compassion and how we take care of ourselves, being kind to ourselves and not being overly critical is a really important protective factor for staff. Teaching skills then to enhance, enhance self-compassion and continuing to put systems in place to support staff, we know reduces the severity and prevalence of secondary traumatic stress and burnout. So that's the bedrock of the whole new way. So now I am gonna talk about Ben's story um, and um, I'm gonna tell you about Ben and hope that that will help to bring alive what Rob's been talking about and what I've just been talking about. So Ben is a 16 year old boy who lives in Nottingham and he was diagnosed with colitis, which is a digestive disease uh, where there's inflammation of the lining of the colon. In Ben's case, um, we see how without integrated access to integrated or joined up care, he found himself with really chronic psychological and physical difficulties. And that this happened in spite of everyone doing the, the best possible thing they could to help him. So Ben was under the care of colleagues in Nottingham and his diagnosis of colitis came after a, a fairly long history of struggling with symptoms. Once he was diagnosed, his family and, and Ben were very optimistic that his treatment of his symptoms would mean that they would go away and go into remission. But unfortunately, he experienced various interventions as very unpleasant and traumatic, and none of his symptoms went away. And in fact, they became a lot worse. This resulted in, in Ben spending nearly all of his time at home and mostly on the toilet. He didn't feel able to leave the family home at all. And at home, Ben was spending up to six hours in the family bathroom. Ben and his parents became increasingly desperate and felt very, very stuck. They really didn't know what to do to help Ben and Ben didn't know what to do to help himself. So in their desperation, that they contacted a charity called Kikra, which is a national charity for Crohn's and colitis. And Kikra linked them with a support worker. And at that point, everyone agreed that it, it, the second opinion, um, a referral for a second opinion that had to a team that had access to psychological support was the way forward. So that's what happened. 
so at that point, um, at that point, um, our gastro colleagues in Nottingham, Nottingham contacted Rob and Rob saw Ben in a morning clinic and he subsequently called me and asked me if I, if I was around to join him. So they'd had a really difficult journey to Cambridge and they'd stayed over in a travel lodge. Um, and when I agreed to join Rob, um, unfortunately, Ben had felt unable to leave the outpatient toilet. So the meeting went ahead just with the parents. And at that point, we put together a plan. And from Ben's perspective, none of the medication seemed to be helping him. And Rob started to, to plan with Ben how to reduce it and work out what, if anything, was helping with his physical symptoms. At that point, my child psychiatry colleague um, joined me and we teamed up to offer a joint appointment to Ben together. That was literally the following day. And we decided to offer two face-to-face -face appointments with a few hours apart in case Ben was held up in the toilet or they were having difficulty getting to the appointment. In fact, they didn't manage to leave the family home. And we, we arranged instead on that day, a virtual FaceTime appointment. This was in February, 2020. So in fact, we've never met Ben live um, as all our work was subsequently done virtually due to COVID. So our plan involved meeting with Dr. Srivalandi, he's a child psychiatrist in the team, and Ben met together and they started on some medication to help Ben reduce and manage his, his very high and understandable levels of anxiety. And um, they, met, they, met quite, they met quite a few times and as he started to feel more settled and his anxiety was more managed, um, I started to meet with Ben weekly and then fortnightly. So we did some individual work and we did some family work and we had some joint meetings with Shri and Rob. And six months later, in November last year, Ben was back in college and is on track living his full life again. So he was discharged from us, this, our services at the end of last year and has made incredible progress. So Ben was highly motivated to change, but he needed the right people around him. And flexing around the young person to ensure the right professionals can be available at the right times and all joined up with the family system is, is our vision for the whole child. And I spoke to Ben today to see if there was anything he wanted um, me to share or say this evening. And this is what he said. The work that we all did together really helped. It was a constant support and being able to be in control of the change myself. I've come a long way. I'm in a completely different place than I was last year. I've just applied to university and I could not have imagined that this time last year. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. That was really moving to hear about the changes that has been made to, to Ben's life and indeed his family life. And although we might be stuck in this lockdown, I, I do believe that something that, such as your support and your team's support to his family life would have made it absolutely important for him to be able to get out and about, have some fresh air and indeed make it to university. So well done, Ben. I'm sure everyone's proud. Uh, our final speaker tonight is Professor David Rorich of the Head of Paediatrics at the K at University of Cambridge. He'll be talking to us about the research. Over to you, David. Thanks uh, very much, Nikki. I'll share my screen. <laughs> Um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, you've heard about the um, exceptional commitment that our team in Cambridge Children's Hospital makes to treating the whole child. And now I'd like to um, explain the value of, of research, University of Cambridge research embedded in the hospital and our vision for how we can make a difference. We call this treating the whole life. And this image shows, of course, a picture of a baby uh, with the you know, inappropriate label of adult but actually as a pediatrician and looking to the future, uh, this is how we will increasingly view our pediatric patients for the adults we become, that, it, that they become. And let me take you through a few slides to show you how, why this makes sense and how we think we can make a big impact in the approach to disease, not just uh, in children, but also setting a course for a healthy middle age and, and, and elderly life. Um, we believe and there's good evidence that many of the chronic diseases that we think of as middle-aged diseases, such as diabetes and heart disease, will have their origins at much earlier time points. Mental health, 75% of these presentations will have occurred by age 25, 
suggesting the origins will be earlier in that window of not to 25 years. And the new definition of pediatrics in the NHS long-term plan is for not to 25 years. So pediatrics is in a prime position now to care for children and young people and identify the origins of disease. So if we think about the types of serious problems that, that children might have, including perinatal death, neonatal disease, serious genetic diseases, cancer and mental health, and then also across the life course, to what extent can we identify the origins of those diseases earlier so that we can intervene? And we come up with a model shown here uh, that we will identify biomarkers for the origins of disease so that we have early detection of uh, disease, providing a, a better insight into the disease condition and also how we might intervene. Early interventions applied to maximize long-term impact. Um, and we think holistically about physical and mental health. And this encapsulates the research vision uh, to be able to decrease disease burden and increase health across the life course. Now, I won't have time to take you through many specific examples, but I do want to um, provide one example, um, which harks back to the you know, incredible history that Cambridge has in genetics and genomics. And many of you on the call will know the great discoveries that have occurred right in our community, including the structure of DNA, DNA sequencing, the type of technology that it's allowed for the, world, um, the world's largest sort of um, uh, approach to whole genome sequencing, which was a company called Selexa um, that was created uh, by Shankar Balsubramanian, now integrated into Illumina, which is the largest provider worldwide of whole genome sequencing. So we can put these tools now into practice for children. And this makes sense because, uh, as I mentioned, serious genetic diseases can present in children and they're a leading cause of death in the first year of life. So can we improve the time to diagnosis and, and, and make for better, better clinical decision making with this information. Now, I'm gonna try to show a um, video and I hope that um, you'll be able to hear this. This is from a 2019 presentation on BBC. This is life at its most vulnerable, made even more perilous when the cause of a baby's sickness is unknown. In some cases, it can take months or even years to get a diagnosis, but that is set to change because of genome sequencing. What are you trying to do to me? Millie May and her parents, Claire and Chris, each had their genome, their entire genetic code, sequenced to try to discover why she was having life-threatening seizures. The results showed Millie May has a rare form of epilepsy caused by a single gene error, not inherited from her parents. It led to immediate improvements in her care. Since we've had the diagnosis, it's been a lot better. We had, uh, we had to change one of her medications um, due to the fact that the one that she was on was obviously aggravating um, the type of epilepsy that she has. We saw a big difference as soon as that change was made. It's priceless. That one test result obviously allowed us to put all of the correct people in place and make the best for her. Sequencing the billions of letters of DNA code that make up a genome used to be hugely expensive. Now it costs less than a thousand pounds. Scientists in Cambridge analyzed the genomes of 350 children in intensive care, comparing it to the DNA of their parents. They found one in four children had a genetic disorder and were able to give the diagnosis in two weeks. This study shows conclusively that whole genome sequencing is of real benefit to patients, speeding up diagnosis and helping to find the right treatment. From next year throughout England, the NHS will offer whole genome testing to all babies and children where the cause of their illness is unknown. The first national health service in the world to do so. And, and so, um, you know, Fergus Walsh had it just right. and. Um, the study in Cambridge was very impressive to Department of Health and Social Care and uh, the Chief Scientific Officer of NHS England. And so a year later, in October of, of um, 2020, a national service uh, providing whole genome or whole exome sequencing to intensively ill children throughout the UK was stood up in Exeter 
um, led by uh, Sean Ellard. And Cambridge will continue now to be um, optimizing these tools uh, for improving uh, diagnosis of children with these conditions. So being on the Addenbrooke's Bio Campus, you know, we intend to plug into these terrific scientific expertise, coming up with ideas like, you know, whole genome sequencing and personalized medicine and other insights into disease mechanism to provide new therapies and new diagnostic approaches for children. We're in the ideal position to do so. And the university is now launching a university-wide uh, child health research initiative. And you can just imagine the depth and breadth of studies we can, uh, we, we can bring to now focus on um, health of children and young people. We're also thinking ahead to training and taking a regional approach to training and, and functioning as a catalyst for the region. And I'm excited to announce that in partnership with Health Education England and uh, working with uh, Norfolk and North, uh, Norwich Trust, um, creating a new program for teaching where we will take pediatric junior doctor specialist trainees and pair them with fourth and fifth year medics. And it will be a sort of peer to peer um, teaching program called Pediatric Clinical Supervisors Program. Uh, this was launched last year and now will be rolled out, uh, COVID permitting, uh, more widely throughout the East of England region. We'll be the first uh, region of HEE that will have this, uh, you know, junior doctor to medical student teaching. And we think that will be a great, uh, you know, um, opportunity for uh, junior doctors that want to become medical educators and also provides a different venue for students to get their uh, didactic teaching. A new curriculum for medics, junior doctors, and staff supporting the integrated physical mental health care provision that Rob and Sally have told you about. So we imagine we will be upskilling our nurses, upskilling our junior doctors and staff. Uh, and we think that this will be also attractive uh, to those that want to learn, you know, that, that how to manage patients holistically, we think a model for the country and, and, and an example of how we can progress the field of pediatrics. So to sum up, um, you know, Cambridge Children's Hospital sees its mission as delivering for the region, but also advancing children's health globally. Uh, it will be the first hospital of its kind that is purpose-built for the seamless integration of physical and mental health care and research, serving the 1.5 ch million children and young people in the East of England. We aim to support community practices, provide retrieval and specialist services so care can occur closer to home and our research to understand the origins of disease and personalized interventions to prevent health risks from becoming disease. Um, to do this, we have embarked uh, on a new collaborative fundraising campaign to raise 100 million pounds, which we call A Whole New Way, which will launch this year and bring an additional resource to the NHS. This will be one of the images that you may see in and around Cambridge and will start to populate our website as we will try to maximize the NHS inv investment by um, and doubling it to support our vision for clinical uh, care and research. I'd like to stop there and thank you very much for your attention. We're looking forward to your questions. Thank all three speakers for, um, for the presentation today. There has been a couple of questions that have come in. I don't know if there's anything that's come in via Facebook. Um, I just want to give a little bit more background to me and my links into the hospital and to the hosp my hospital journey per se. So um, my husband is a doctor at the uh, Addenbrookes, however, um, my son Ethan was born in South End Hospital in 2009 and he was 16 weeks early. He was 24 week plus one day. He was born at one pound, one ounce. He was extremely tiny, he was extremely poorly. And he um, was sent to the NICU in Luton and then on to the NICU at Royal London Hospital for treatment. And in between that, once he finally did come home, um, he then entered the PICU in excess of nine times. And we visited hospitals such as um, St. George's in Tooting, St. Mary's in Paddington, walked back to Royal London for surgery, um, Great Ormond Street for surgery. Our appointment lists and my appointment book was it's something that you just wouldn't believe. We had appointments that we had to go to for Royal London for surgery reasons. We then had appointments we had to go to to um, Great Ormond Street for, for lung issues, for heart issues, for bowel issues. We then had appointments at our local hospital and, um, and outpatients clinics. The list was incredible. So the fact 
that knowing that despite the fact that he's no longer with us, but knowing that other families who were in my situation will no longer have to travel like that, will no longer be spread across the region, um, is, is absolutely amazing. And just think of the amount of children and families that we can help even more so because you're giving back, you're giving them back that travel time that they would have had to have used by coming in, by doing it in a different way. And by looking at this in the, in the whole child view, you are looking at it from every aspect. And I think that's absolutely amazing. And I just can't wait to get this started. And so I do want to let everybody know and remind everybody of the children's, uh, the website is cambridgechildrens.org.uk. So you can go to that to find out more information about the children's hospital and also to donate towards it. We have had a couple of questions come in and I think the first one looks like it's probably going to be for Rob. Um, and that is, how do you see schools and other educational settings engaging with the children's hospital? And that was from Frankie. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, thanks, Frankie, for the question. I, I guess we, um, th there's a number of ways that, that we've already discussed around how we can um, involve children from schools. So on a number of different levels. So local schools um, will be party to, will have the option to join our children's networks uh, a, a network that will support design, that will support fundraising ideas, um, but also um, in, in help, helping to plan the type of um, educational opportunities and educational resources that we need in our, in our children's school. So um, links with, with teachers and with children across the region will, towards um, the end of the uh, fundraising campaign, really come into the community link that we want to build with Addenbrooke's Charitable Trust. So children, uh, I hope, will support us in fundraising right across the region um, in, um, I suppose, topping out the um, huge fundraising total that, that we're after. So involvement in design, involvement in um, engaging with, with parents and, and hopefully involvement in fundraising. Great, and we have a second question from Alex Flynn, which is given the current issues with staffing across the nursing profession, do you have a strategy for how you'll be able to recruit and train the required number of staff for the new hospital? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to, to take that first. I, and, and of course, staffing is a major issue. Um, I guess what we're hoping is to deal with some of the existing staffing problems, um, both on the CPFT and CUH side by offering a really unique training opportunity uh, in a unique environment. So there certainly, we hope, will be um, the Cambridge Children's sort of magnet effect that will pull people to our region who want to work in a specialist um, children's environment. And we know that we lose staff and experienced staff very often to um, other children's hospitals around the country. So um, I think there's there's the attraction of working in a, in a holistic environment. There's the attraction that we hope will come with um, providing a, a baseline expertise for all staff around mental health and psychologically informed care um, without, um, I hope, um, running into the problem of, of um, pulling staff away from local hospitals. A big chunk that we sort of have hinted at is, is our educational responsibility around the region for staff. And we hope that we can develop um, shared training, rotations, um, uh, and, and training that will allow us, um, as, as we've mentioned, to try and deliver as much care um, to close to where the, the, the children live. So that involves rotations with the Norfolk and Norwich, as David pointed out, or opportunities to, to share expertise with staff um, in other pediatric centres. So, uh, it, it's it's clearly a headache in this day and age, but um, I think we've we've got some um, ideas about how to mitigate that. There's a few questions that come in on um, fundraising. So if I can just call, pull them all together so that we can save some time on them. Um, so one question was, how can we all help to raise money for this major project so that our children in the east of the region receive tangible benefits? And then we've also had a question in saying, 
um, that the um, Corinne said that she's curious how the fundraising team focused on major gifts will work within the local community to contribute by raising funds with small scale initiatives when such things are possible again. I believe many of us who have had children looked after in Adam Books would be keen to help to collectively contribute to the 100 million needed and I occur, I, I do agree with, with her in saying that. Um, and then how can, uh, I just think there was another question for that was it from Graham. I accept you're confident about raising 100 million, but if you only manage to raise, say, 80 million, what will be missing is the cutoff time for fundraising when plans are put in for planning permission. So over to you, Rob. Rob, maybe I could take that one. Yeah, um, yeah um, thanks very much. Um, I think um, one thing to say is that our collaboration between the University of Cambridge and the medical charities is critical. So with the University of Cambridge, we're looking internationally for donors that will appreciate the vision we have for research, which we really do believe is a world, you know, first. Um, and we are seeing great interest from, you know, various parts of the world uh, where people, we hope, will be able to come up with those leading large donations. As someone, one of the questions mentioned, we do need to sort of pin our early progress to very large donations. Um, and University of Cambridge is a brand and it's also a fantastic alumnus uh, network that we can really, um, you know, look to for um, um, potential support. The other incredibly important aspect is the relationship with the community and how we will incorporate and will be able to accept and be very grateful for all the small gifts or medium-sized gifts and really make this a community project. And having community ownership is very much what we intend to do. It may not be our very first focus just because of some of the aggressive um, gateways that we need to get through in the first, um, you know, um, few uh, parts of the project, especially the next six months. But we are planning now already the Regional Ambassadors Network, a plan for events and a plan to incorporate the community. Uh, and so there will be many opportunities. In the meantime, please visit our website where uh, you can both contribute your ideas. There are, that we're, we're trying to, to get engagement and, and find um, uh, people that would, would like to feed into our vision for the hospital or how it could be designed and built. Um, there is the opportunity to donate now. Uh, and if you visit our website, you'll, you'll see some of that information. There's some more technical questions about the children's hospital build. Um, so I will try to group those together. Will all the pediatric specialists, including in and out patients and all the support services be accommodated in the new children's hospital or will some be accessed at Addenbrookes? Equally so, when the children's and cancer hospitals have approved are both, amped, are both open, will children and ca with cancer get fully treated in the children's hospital or would they also use the cancer hospital services, for example, MRI screening and chemo? And then there were some questions in regards to training, which is the holistic approach, um, the extra training needed for um, registered children's nurses who are not registered in mental health nurses, but are in increasingly managing more complex needs. So maybe, Nikki, I'll kick off with the, the scope um, uh, question about what exactly will go in. And, and of course, that's, that's right on the, the exactly what we're, we're deliberating now with the design team that have arrived. We need to really work out over the next six months what we can afford to build and what we need to prioritize to build. So, of course, we want to get as much of the clinical services um, into one location. Um, it depends a little bit on um, our uh, availability of fundraising and of capital and negotiations with the Department of Health, the regional support um, from partners who, who clearly want children repatriated into the region as to how uh, large this hospital will be. Um, I think it's safe to say that, that we will um, not be able to put absolutely everything in. Um, and I think um, what is clear is that the development of the Addenbrookes campus will take time. And I think the one thing that we can say for now is that the emergency department, we really want to support in and around the adult main campus setting. Um, so that expertise from major trauma um, is, is all contained in one place. But as far as the other services are concerned, where possible, we want to have these based in the new children's hospital. And that includes cancer. Um, it includes cancer and the discussions that we've had really up to the age of the 19th birthday um, with services that, of course, some children, some older children 
um, will, will start their journey in a, uh, an adult hospital if it's appropriate. Some children um, may stay longer in a children's hospital. And we, we very much want to work across the age range with our TYA colleagues um, in oncology and hematology you know, to give, to give children the best option. The fantastic opportunity we've got here, unlike in a standalone children's hospital, is the proximity to great adult services. So if it's right for a child to, to start their journey on an, on an adult cancer ward, then of course that's appropriate for a 19 or an 18 year old. Um, but, but we want to play to our strengths. And um, as far as we can see, all services up until the 19th birthday will, will sit in a children's hospital um and uh you know if we need to trim the scope then then that's a discussion that will happen over the the next six months or so there's a few questions there was one question will the child development center stay where it is that was from caroline and then there was another one will you be working and in integrating with local primary health care and community pediatric teams in delivering better care to children which i think we was um, addressed in the presentation but it would be good just to point on that and then um, will the, what would the link be with Patworth? And that's an interesting question, an important one. Um, so I, I, I leave that, to, and then I've got a comment from Mary Archer, which I'd like to read out. Um, so uh, maybe in, in reverse order, the, the Papworth um, question, of course, we want to link in with all the expertise that's available. There is no intention at the moment to develop a transplant program because there are excellent transplant centers for children around the country. But we have a mind, you know, we are cited on um, the flexibility of this building incorporating future change and who knows what the developments will be over 10 or 20 years with Papworth. So um, our, our health planners will work with us to keep the building as flexible as possible for future developments. Um, the community and, and, and primary care integration, of course, is, is key for a hospital that wants to keep children out of hospital. Um, to work with getting them home quickly and, and managing and supporting them at home. So our community partners are um, critical. It's worth remembering that the primary care um, uh, for, for the, the activity for our hospital is, is really only about 25% of children that we see at Addenbrooke's are local children. 75% come from GP surgeries and, and hospitals around the region. So um, the the, the interaction with primary care is, is a little bit more um, uh, challenging. And there was one other question around... CDC, I think. CDC, yes. yes. I, I think that the answer, at least for the moment, is yes. CDC will stay where CDC is. Um, there is a question from Sp Clive Spindley, which was well, more of a point to please start to recognise the importance of integrating the data. Lots of people equals confusion. Lots of data equals efficiency. And uh, just a reminder that there is a generational divide in that children like technology. And I'm, I'm sitting in my son's room with a green light above my head. So that's a point I think well taken. And they love and depend on apps. And again, this is done by an app, which is why I can't turn it off because I have no idea how it works. <laughs> Um, so just to acknowledge that, but I just also want to read out a really nice comment from Mary Archer. Um, she is the co-chair for the fundraising board. She said, thank you for the inspiring presentation. This will truly be a whole new way. And I look forward to the launch of the fundraising campaign in the spring. Um, David has already explained how we will run this and she's looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to joining her on that fundraising campaign as well, as that is actually my, my um, background as well. Um, do we have any other questions? I think there's just been a comment just to say that the hospital needs to be huge, um, but we, we know that, but we're also really aware, aren't we, that when we, we had the map up of all the different departments that a family or a child might have to use within Addenbrookes and how it's spread over such a wide area, um, that having it all under one roof, not only will be better for the child and the families, but will be better for their mental health to know that, that they know where they're going to be going. They can see it in their mind's eye. And also there's something that I've been really fo focusing on in my meetings, because I am one of the governor consultants and the, I'm not, I'm a counsellor consultant on the children's hospital build. I get confused with the two roles I have. Um, and it is about thinking about if you've got very, very sick children and their complex needs, if they need to be an inpatient, what are we going to do with their families? We need to make sure that we have the support network 
there to be able to support those families on site so that they don't have to come and go from home because as you say this is going to be for the whole region so people will be coming across region quite some way in some cases you've already spoken about Ben from Nottingham and their families will need somewhere to stay to feel at home to be able to have that support for their child as well so it's something that I know is ongoing and it's really exciting do we have any final Oh, will there be a swimming pool and hydrotherapy? Um, to be honest, we're not quite at that level of detail yet, but um, we certainly have um, had um, discussions about a rehab facility for children. And, and we know that um, that is really desperately um, needed, not only in the region, but in the whole of the south of, you know, south of England. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the reality is a lot of this, as we know, is dependent on funding and um, we have, all have to work hard and work together to to leverage um, the fundraising and take that back to the government to say, you know, we want to do a proper job for for children right across the region. And um, that's going to need all of us um, putting pressure on MPs uh, and important people who can make these decisions. Indeed, it, and I think the only place that I can think of that has a hydrotherapy pool at the moment is the children's hospitals each um, from memory, in, luckily in the region in any case. Um, and, and so a hydrotherapy pool will be needed, but as you say, it is up to funding. And if we can exceed the 100,000, then who knows what we can do and what we can achieve. And we just need to get people behind us to help us raise more than what we should be raising. And also to keep knocking on the door of government to say, you know what, if you've got any spare pennies, then we could use it because we could be doing something, we are doing something totally amazing. This is a first in the world, I believe. And um, why shouldn't it be? And why shouldn't it be here in Cambridge to help for the whole of the Eastern region? Um, Sally, do you have any comments that you want to add? Yeah, thank you. I, I've just got one really, which is the, it, it links with the question of, uh, about whether we're going to connect with community pediatricians and, and reaching out. And I think reaching out is fundamental to this project and this vision and connecting with our colleagues in the community. Uh, we can't do this. We can't. We can't move forward with an integrated mental health, whole child, new way of vision without doing that. And I think that clinical pathways and working alongside, together with connecting up, thinking about the child's journey and the family's journey it is what this project's all about. And linking across the whole region. And we we know that 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 there are sometimes perceptions that Adam Adam Brooks is the, is the place that. Um, in a sense is, that is a bit of hub for resources and we're acutely aware, keen and totally committed to this project being a, about connecting everyone up and, and thinking about we don't want children coming in for outpatient appointments when they can be seen locally. They should only be coming into this hospital if this hospital is offering something that can, uh, they can only get there. And that, that, so I think it offers a fantastic opportunity for us to shape and develop services in a new way. Um, we actually have a question for you, Sally, and that is, will children with mental health problems be cared for by mental health nurses? Um, the whole issue is about an integration. So at the moment, services are quite separate. So there will be still be some services in, in some areas that will predominantly be, be mental health services. But for this hospitals about envisioning both. I mean, I don't know whether you want to comment about that, Rob. It's a bit it's a tricky one because it depends which which part of which bits of service we're talking about. I think what's clear, you know, we don't want um, to reduce the expertise that mental health nurses bring to mental health patients or physical health to physical health um, patients. Um, but what we do want to do is um, try and, and create an environment where the expertise is available um, for each individual child as, as to what they need. So. It's not that we're wanting to dual train everyone all the way up to a fully, you know, signed off uh, RMN or R RCN. Um, but what we do want to do is provide everyone with a baseline of insight and, as, and as I said, a sort of psycho psychologically informed provision of care. Um, so we still expect there to be expert surgical nurses, mental health nurses, medical nurses and so on. 
I think that's all we've got time for, but I know that we could talk a long time about this project and so we should. Um, and I do know that this is the first of many talks on the children's hospital that, that will be coming up. And so um, if you haven't managed to get onto this one, there will be more. And I know that the CU CUH will be advertising when those next are. But the message really is to become a member of the of Adam Brooks of the CUH family and to go onto the website, which is uh, cambridgechildrens.org.uk. And if you've got any money that you'd like to donate, then please do so, and you can do so via that website. Thank you all to all the um, presentation speakers today. It really has been fascinating listening to you and really exciting. And I look forward to talking with you soon. Thank you all. <laughs>